Hey guys, Uncharted History here. This is the very first installment of a new challenge that I'm dubbing the Wikipedia Random Challenge. So you see this little random article button here in the corner? Uh, I'm going to press this and the first three historical articles I come across are going to be subject to intense historical research which I will present to you. Uh, the only concession is that I'm not going to cover any articles covering anything that occurred after the year 1900 uh, because, you know, Wikipedia is just obviously drowning in those kinds of articles. So we're looking a bit deeper than that. So if you please, let's go on this hopefully rather intriguing adventure into uncharted history. Okay, so let's press it. What is the first one going to be? It's a shrub, so not exactly history. Of course, it has its own history related to human usage of it, I guess. But we're going to go for something else. What's the first historical art article going to be? This is a person who, uh, who sadly passed, but still lived after the year 1900. So let's give it another go. Okay, a family of Orobatids. What even are they? Okay, this happened last year. What is this? This is more linguistics than history. Okay, this was founded in 2000, so no thank you. This is a modern band. This is... Is this an anime or something? It's an anime video game? Okay, not history. Is this history? No. Well, not history old enough for us. Okay. Dickie Boyle. Okay, this is the first historical guy we're going to cover. Uh, Wikipedia is really oversaturated in these uh, athlete profiles, but whatever, this guy lived prior to 1900, so let's look at this guy. So, Dickie Boyle, let's just bookmark this, add bookmark, Dickie Boyle, rather funny name, I gotta say. Uh, okay, let's do another random article. Hmm, no, no, 1973, not 1873, consanguinism, this is philosophy, I, I closely related to history, of course, but, uh, hmm, no thank you, nope, Deepak, it's a last name, so I guess it could extend prior to 1900, but none of the people here seem to have been from before that date, so let's keep looking. Wilson Hills. Hmm. Now, this is a geographical feature, but it does, you know, it's a, it's a geographical feature with its own history. So, we're going to count Wilson Hills. All right, it has exploration history from prior to 1900, and we'll cover the stuff from after 1900, too. Very interesting. It's near the South Pole. Pretty cool. Let's look at that. Let's add a little bookmark here. Add it. Then another random article search. Our final search. Hmm. Paoli, Wisconsin. Is this our next article? Let's look at this. It's, it's offered two state assemblymen, I guess. That's impressive. I don't know. Uh, hmm. Well... This guy, pretty interesting. So let's look at the history of Pauley, Wisconsin. So what are we doing? We're adding a bookmark. Okay, okay. Well, I'll check back in with you once I've completed in-depth research into all these fascinating historical subjects that I've just now encountered for the very first time. See ya! Hey guys, I'm back, and it's safe to say that what I found was far more interesting than what these articles make these things seem. Now, first, we're going to be looking into the history of Paoli, 
a tiny town in southern Wisconsin which takes pride in its many century-old buildings, and whose story is intimately tied to that of a single intrepid carpenter from Pennsylvania. Next, we'll be exploring the history of the Wilson Hills, a desolate, totally inhospitable mountain range on the coast of Antarctica that's witnessed centuries of people trying to test humanity's utmost limits, sometimes with disastrous results. It also features an abandoned base built by the Soviets. Finally, we'll be glimpsing into the life of the forgotten Scottish soccer star, Dickie Boyle, who once played in front of tens of thousands of spectators and with some of the best teams in Britain, only to become so obscure that we pretty much have no idea what he did after his soccer days were over. Now, because of how long this video turned out to be, treat it more like a short podcast episode supplemented with images rather than my usual sort of video with images all over the place. So let's start from where we just left off, the unincorporated community of Paoli in Dane County, southern Wisconsin. Even though the Wikipedia article makes it seem like there isn't much to be said about Paoli, that couldn't be further from the truth. The story of Paoli starts with one man, Peter W. Matz. According to one 1880 history of Dane County, Matz was born in 1814, somewhere in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. There aren't any pictures of Peter Matz, so just know that all the pictures I use for him aren't actually him. By his early 20s, he was working as a carpenter in New York City, but in 1837, he decided to head west, first to Indianapolis and then to Madison, Wisconsin, in Dane County. There, he'd marry Helen R. Dixon in 1842, a woman he'd go on to have a whopping seven children with, but this was pretty normal for the time. Somehow, even though he was just a carpenter, between 1845 and 1846, he was able to buy six to eight hundred acres of land, as well as the water privileges for it in the township of Montrose, just 15 miles south of Madison. The date of this acquisition and the chronology of Matt's achievements differ between the various sources I used, but I'll just go with what the 1880 history of Dane County says because Matz was alive and kicking when it was published. In 1846, Matz was also elected to the position of Sheriff of Dane County. The first thing Matz seems to have done on his new property was damming a meander of the Sugar River, which is itself a tributary of the Pecatonica River in nearby northern Illinois. He did this in order to create a half-mile-long mill race, a channel of swiftly flowing water that turns a mill's water wheel. So, of course, the first building Matz erected on his new land was a sawmill he built along the mill race with his brother in 1847. This was soon followed by his home, a tavern, and a general store, until before you knew it, a village started to grow around Matz's mill. In 1848, the same year Wisconsin was admitted into the Union, Matz was re-elected to the position of sheriff, but he'd go on to hold plenty of other important offices, too. At some point, he was also commissioned as a major in the state militia, by Territorial Governor Henry Dodge, whose term ended in 1848, so we know it has to have happened in that year or before that. Afterwards, he was affectionately known as Major Matz. Just five years later, in 1853, Matz was elected to Wisconsin's State Assembly, and during the 1854 session, he was a Republican, although it seems that previously he was a member of the ill-fated Whig Party. For six to eight years, Matz also acted as the chairman of the town board of Montrose, which Paoli was within and still is. This basically meant he was Montrose's mayor at that time. Just to top things off, Matz was also a justice of the peace, too. But back to the little village sprouting up around Matz's mill. In 1856, Matz planned out a town and dubbed it Paoli after a town near his birthplace in Pennsylvania, which was also named Paoli. That Paoli was founded in the mid-1700s and was named after General Pasquale Paoli of Corsica, who was the island's leader from 1755 to 69 and wrote the first ever democratic constitution in Europe. Well, I guess besides the Athenian one, but anyways, he was ousted by the French in 1769 and fled to England, where, ironically enough, he was given a pension by George III, of all people, whose tyranny, of course, helped cause the Revolutionary War. Matz would go on to sell his mill to two brothers from Bavaria, Bernhard and Francis Minch, in 1865. 
they proceeded to build a three-story tall limestone-walled flouring mill on the property. As for Matz, as of 1880, he had sold most of his land and was reportedly resting from the wear and tear of a long, useful, and well-spent life, according to the history of Dane County from that year. He passed away on July 2nd, 1903, just after his 89th birthday, and was buried in the cemetery named after his town, which lies just south of it. Paoli thrived between 1860 and the turn of the century. By 1870, it had reached a population of 1,156, which is actually slightly higher than its current population, or rather its population in 2017, which was 1,095 people. In addition to the saw and grist mills, by the mid-1870s, Paoli featured a school, a post office, two churches, two hotels, and a cheese factory, an absolute must in any town in Wisconsin, a dance hall, doctors, and several tradesmen. The first room of Paoli's schoolhouse, its front gable, had been built back in 1854 when Matt still owned the mill and would continue to be used as a school until 1972. There are still two churches in Paoli today, too, but they both seem to have been built after this point. The one church from this time I do know of was the Paoli Methodist Episcopal Church. I don't think it's still around anymore. The Minch brothers and other Wisconsin mill operators felt pressure from other northern mills, so they shut the sawmill down in 1877, but their flouring mill would endure for a while afterwards. Paoli suffered another blow, though, when the Chicago, Madison, and Northern Railroad bypassed it in 1888. But despite these setbacks, Paoli would continue to thrive for a while past the turn of the century and around it. It featured a band, a baseball team, and a theater group. New buildings also sprang up. These include Paoli House, which was built in 1899 by the Fairback Brewing Company and was used as a bar and dining room. It was also used to process hops brought in by farmers and possibly also as a hotel, too. The side gable of the old schoolhouse was also built around 1900. Paoli's main event center was a place known as Fisher Hall. It held social, political, and holiday events along with the public ground, which I believe is Paoli Park nowadays. Now, one of the Minches, Oscar F. Minch, would be elected to the state assembly, like Matt, in 1896, but as a Democrat, and was re-elected in 1898. He had been born in Paoli in 1868 and helped operate Paoli Mills, in addition to working as a baker in Madison for a while. Much of the milling machinery used by the Minches in the late 19th and early 20th centuries is still intact, amazingly enough, or at the very least it was, as of 1978, right before Paoli Mills was put on the National Register of Historic Places in 1979. But as the mill era came to an end, and with the railroad having bypassed it, Paoli's population went into decline. But somehow, a magnificent Catholic church in the Spanish colonial style, St. William's Catholic Church, was built here in 1925. The Featherston family bought Paoli Mill from the Minches in 1938 and operated it into the 40s, but soon afterwards the mill finally closed and was used as storage for the Featherston's feed and seed business. This stone building was built in front of the old mill in 1956 and was originally used as a scale house, which means that trucks were weighed here before and after delivering grain. But Paoli was now in a rather sad state overall. However, it's recently been revived. An effort to rebrand Paoli as an artist's community and shopping destination was spearheaded by local visionary Bill Hastings, who opened Paoli Cheese in the Scale House, which has been replaced by Paoli Mercantile more recently. A new town hall was also recently acquired, and new businesses have been opened in restored old buildings. The back of the mill is now occupied by a brewery in Tap House. Paoli House was occupied by an art gallery, which seems to have gone under and is now home to a bicycle shop. And the old schoolhouse, which was recently a cafe is now a bistro. But it seems that a number of businesses that were around in late 2014 have shut their doors, which may just be a result of choosing high-risk business niches like Cluck the Chicken Store, now defunct. But all in all, the little town of Paoli has been experiencing tremendous renewal. So if you ever find yourself in southern Wisconsin, it might not be a bad idea to check it out. Now on to Wilson Hills. I know Wisconsin can get pretty frigid, but it's definitely not as bleak and desolate as this place. But even still, it's bore witness to more than a century of men testing their absolute limits, sometimes with truly tragic results. 
Wilson Hills are a group of scattered hills, ridges, and nunataks, which is a fancy term for the tops of mountains sticking out from glaciers in Antarctica. It goes northwest-southeast for around 70 miles. Matasevich Glacier is at its northwestern extremity, and Pryor Glacier separates it from the Usarp Mountains at its southeastern extremity. So where exactly in Antarctica are the Wilson Hills? Well, they sit a bit inland from the Oates Coast, which is fittingly a part of Oates Land, a slice of Australia's Antarctic claim, which itself is part of a larger slice of land Australia claims called Victoria Land. Oates Land is situated just to the west of the coast of the Ross Sea, which is part of New Zealand's claim known as the Ross Dependency. Victoria Land as a whole was first discovered all the way back in 1841 by Royal Navy officer James Clark Ross. Sound familiar? On his 1839 to 1843 expedition to Antarctica. So less than a decade prior to Paoli being established by Peter Matz. But Oates Land itself was first discovered by Royal Navy Lieutenant Harry Pennell during the British Antarctic Expedition of 1910 to 1913, led by Antarctic explorer Robert Falcon Scott, which you're going to be hearing a lot more about. Pennell first sighted Oates Coast on the expedition ship Terra Nova, which he was the commander of, on February 22, 1911. Pennell was a very energetic, hard-working man who was one of the few members of the expedition to survive it. Afterwards, he was promoted to commander of the HMS Queen Mary. Unfortunately, it was sunk with him on board on May 31st, 1916, during the Battle of Jutland. Pennell named the Oates Coast after a fellow member of the expedition, Captain Lawrence Oates, a British Army officer who had served in the Second Boer War. Pennell also discovered the Wilson Hills themselves that same month. It might have been on the same day. I haven't been to Antarctica, so I wouldn't know if the Wilson Hills are visible from Oates Coast. Anyhow, they were named after Edward Wilson, a zoologist, artist, physician, and chief of the scientific staff on Scott's expedition. Pennell helped him study the birds and whales they encountered in Antarctica. So what came of this expedition? Well, to put it simply, disaster. Their goal was to be the first group of humans to ever set foot on the South Pole. They set off from their base camp at Cape Evans at the start of the Ross Ice Shelf on November the 1st, 1911. Although others accompanied them to certain distances before being sent back, the final trek to the Pole consisted of just five men, including Scott, Oates, and Wilson. They did indeed reach the Pole on January the 8th, 1912, but they quickly found out that they weren't the first to reach it. A tent had been left behind there with a note addressed to Scott himself and dated to a mere 35 days prior. 14th December, 1911. It had been left by Norwegian explorer Roald Amundsen and his team, who reached it on their dog sleds. The dogs doubled as food for them. The British team had reached it by manually pulling a heavy sled loaded with their supplies themselves, and that's how they had to return. In addition to their food, they also had to carry the first ever fossils discovered on Antarctica. Oates was the first of the three I've mentioned to pass away, although one member of the five-man party had already passed prior to that from head trauma sustained after a fall into a crevice. Oates was suffering from frostbite and gangrene, so in order to not slow the others down, he walked out of their tent and into a blizzard on 17th March, 1812, his 32nd birthday. Oates' last recorded words were, I'm just going outside and maybe some time. But unfortunately, Oates' heroic act of self-sacrifice couldn't prevent the rest of his comrades from succumbing to the elements as well. On March 19th, 148 miles from their base camp, but just 12.5 miles from a food depot they had created earlier, which could have saved them, the three remaining men were trapped in a blizzard from which they would never emerge. Around March 29th, 1912, they died in their tent. Wilson was probably Scott's closest friend on the journey, and Scott's left arm was found extended onto Wilson when their bodies were found. That happened eight months later. They were buried where they lay under a cairn of snow, topped by a cross made of skis. After the ill-fated Scott expedition, the Wilson Hills and Oates Land as a whole don't seem to have been explored until 1946, when it was explored by the U.S. Navy from 1946 to 47 during what's called Operation High Jump. The Soviets were the next to investigate it during the Soviet Antarctic Expedition of 1958. 
The Australians, naturally, since they claimed this land, were the next to explore the area during the National Antarctic Research Expeditions of 1959, 61, and 62. The U.S. Navy explored the area yet again around the same time, from 1960 to 1964. The U.S. Geological Survey created a comprehensive map of the area using aerial photographs taken by the Navy between 1960 and 1964, possibly as part of what's known as Operation Deep Freeze. A lot of the mountains and ridges and nunataks in the Wilson Hills mapped by the USGS were named by the Advisory Committee on Antarctic Names, also known as ACAN. They were mainly named after Navy personnel or people working for the United States Antarctic Research Program. These include Burt Rocks, named after Devere E. Burt, a biologist who worked at Hallett Station. Two, the 1,050 meter or 3,445 foot high Mount Steele was named after Carlet D. Steele, a helicopter crew member and maintenance supervisor for Operation Deep Freeze. And four-mile-long Axhelm Ridge, named after Commander Charles E. Axhelm of the U.S. Navy, who also participated in Operation Deep Freeze. Oatsland was also explored by the New Zealand Geological Survey Antarctic Expedition of 1963-65. to They also named several other features in the Wilson Hills, including Celestial Peak, Mount Blowaway, and Exiles Nun Attack, which I gotta admit are more creative, but it would be cool to have your name on a mountain. Wouldn't it? Celestial Peak is a granite mountain 1,280 meters or 4,200 feet high, and it has such an ethereal name because the New Zealand expedition set up a survey station at its peak, and they first observed the stars nearby. A 1,320 meter tall Mount Blowaway was named that because three members of the expedition were forced to abandon their plans of putting a survey station there because of a blizzard. The exiles known attacks aren't actually named after any human exiles, which is what I thought at first. They themselves are the exiles referred to in their name because the New Zealanders noticed how isolated they are from the other features of the Wilson Hills. The most recent noticeable impact on the area around the Wilson Hills wasn't made by Kiwis, however. It was made by the Soviets. If you look really closely at the USGS map I've been showing you, you'll see that on Oates Coast, right to the northeast of Burt Rocks and Axhelm Ridge, there's a little dot labeled as... Leningradskaya. It was established by members of the 15th Soviet Antarctic Expedition on February the 25th, 1971, on a 300 meter or a thousand foot high nun attack a few kilometers from the coast for whatever reason. It was operated year round and could support up to 10 people who were Soviet scientists reportedly studying oceanology, meteorology, magnetism, etc. It was open for over 20 years, all the while being assailed by extreme winds and storms. But with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991, it was abandoned due to a lack of funding. But it was left perfectly intact in the hopes that operations there would be resumed shortly, which didn't happen. It hasn't been occupied since 1991, but it still holds old Soviet supplies and equipment. I'm sure Bald and Bankrupt would absolutely love it. There has been talk of reopening it, but that talk has never really been acted upon, although Russian icebreakers are known to have been sent to check on it. Now let's take a look at our final subject for this episode and the subject of the first suitable historical article we found on Wikipedia, remember? Legendary late Victorian Scottish soccer player Dickie Boyle. He was born as Richard Hale Boyle in September 1869 in Dumbarton, Dumbartonshire, Scotland. Besides that, I could find almost nothing about his personal life, but I did find a whole lot about his life as a soccer star. We even know that he was 5 foot 6 inches and weighed 158 pounds during it. So let's wade into his distinguished career, shall we? He was a right half and a right back, and started his career with the Dumbarton Episcopalians in 1885. The next year, he played for Methlin Park, before joining hometown professional game Dumbarton in 1888, starting his senior career. Dumbarton Football Club team's players are nicknamed the Suns, because Dumbarton residents are themselves nicknamed the Sons of the Rock, because a volcanic plug called Dumbarton Rock overlooks their town. It's the same reason their badge consists of an elephant with a castle on top of it. The rock is said to resemble an elephant, and Dumbarton Castle sits atop 
Dumbarton Rock. Dickie Boyle's senior debut for Dumbarton was at a Scottish Cup game held at Motherwell in October of 1888, where the Suns won 6-2. Boyle won two representative caps for Dumbarton Shirts soon afterwards during the 1889-1890 season. These caps are given out to every player in an international match of soccer in Great Britain, and although he would play for Scotland against the English in 1892, I don't know what matches he gained these two caps at. But he really hit his stride when, with him on their team, the Suns became the champions of the very first two Scottish League championships in a row, the 1890 to 1891 championship and the 1891 to 92 championship. In the final championship playoff of 1891, Dumbarton went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Glasgow Rangers in front of 10,000 people at Hathken Park, Glasgow, on May 21st. It ended as a 2-2 draw, so the Suns and the Rangers were joint league champions that year. That same year, Dumbarton nearly won the Scottish Cup, but in the final, they unfortunately lost 1-0 to Edinburgh's Hardham Midlothian FC at Hampton Park, now Cathkin Park, on February the 7th, 1891, in front of 14,000 people. In the final championship playoff of the 1891-2 Scottish League Championship on May the 7th, 1892, Dumbarton won yet again against Abercorn and became league champions yet again. Dickie Boyle was an international trialist in 1892, but unfortunately didn't win a full cap for Scotland. However, he did represent the Scottish League in a draw with the Football League of England at Pikes Lane Bolton in April 1892. Overall, Boyle scored six goals and made 59 appearances for Dumbarton, although Wikipedia disputes those figures slightly. But that very year, he went down to England and joined the Football League, joining Everton FC. In September of that same year, he made his debut against at Nottingham Forest. Everton FC's team is sometimes nicknamed the Toffees or the Toffee Men by fans because at their three original homes, toffee was sold in huge quantities to spectators. With Boyle on their team, Everton was able to reach the 1893 Football Association Cup Final, where Everton went up against the Wolverhampton Wanderers, also known as the Wolves. It was held on March 25, 1893 at Fallowfield Stadium, Manchester and was witnessed by a whopping 45,000 to 65,000 people. It came out to 1-0 in the Wolves' favor, unfortunately. Dickie Boyle would stay with Everton for almost a decade. Throughout his time there, he only ever missed a single game. He helped Everton become runners-up in the league championship of 1894-95, and the longest winning streak of the 1895-96 football league season, although they didn't win. In 1887, Everton reached the FA Cup Final yet again and faced Aston Villa FC. This match was held at Crystal Palace, London on April 10th, 1897 and was witnessed by nearly 66,000 people. Dickie Boyle himself scored a goal, their second that day, that put Everton in the lead. But that turned out to be Everton's last goal that game. Aston Villa scored another goal and Everton lost 3-2. Everton managed to reach the FA Cup semi-finals in 1898, but didn't do too well in the last couple of years of the 19th century. Unfortunately, Dickie Boyle himself lost his place at the end of the 1899 to 1900 season. However, he stayed with Everton for two further seasons and made nine more appearances. In all, Dickie Boyle scored eight goals and made 250 appearances with Everton FC. Although, again, Wikipedia does slightly dispute that figure. Either way, this was an enormous amount for the time, given that clubs played far fewer matches than they do now. He was on loan with New Brighton Tower FC during the 1901-2 season, but this was actually its very last season as the football club folded in 1901. After nearly a decade in England, Boyle returned to Scotland to play for Dundee FC in the summer of 1902. Dundee FC's team is called the Dark Blues, presumably after their dark blue uniform, and they're also called the D. Boyle played for Dundee FC between 1902 and his retirement in 1906, or possibly 1908, when he was 39. My sources conflict on that point. All in all, he scored three goals and made 72 appearances with Dundee. And that's basically where the trail ends for his life. One source claimed that he moved to Glasgow to take a job at a leading shipbuilding yard in January of 1910, but beyond that I could find nothing on his later life. 
It's pretty humbling to see how a soccer star who played in front of tens of thousands of people and for some of the best British teams of the late 19th century was just completely forgotten by everyone but at least we're talking about him now. That just about wraps up the video, so thank you so much for watching, and make sure to stay tuned for more challenges just like this, and lots of other fun videos on nearly completely uncharted history.